In this video, we'll cover Chapter 7, Chemical Energy. Learning outcomes for this chapter include describing the law of conservation of energy and how it relates to kinetic potential and internal energy of a system, performing calculations that involve internal energy change. This includes heat and work absorbed or evolved in a change. We'll talk about what a state function is and we'll calculate the work done on the system or on the surroundings using data that is provided. We'll then learn how to calculate enthalpy change of a chemical reaction using a calorimeter. We'll learn about Hess's law and how it can be used to determine the enthalpy change for a chemical reaction that we're not able to measure directly. We'll calculate standard enthalpy changes for chemical reactions using data that is obtained from a standard enthalpy of the formation table. And then we'll talk about our current sources of energy, their impact on our environment, and new and future sources of energy. All right, we'll start with the law of the conservation of energy. This law states, of course, that energy can't be created nor destroyed, but rather it can be converted from one form to another. We can think about it in terms of potential energy, the energy a material possesses by virtue of its position, for a chemical compound, this might be uh, the type of energy that exists in a chemical compound's bonds. And then the other type of energy is kinetic energy. This is known as the energy of motion. Um, it depends on both mass and velocity. What about for a chemical compound? How can we think of kinetic energy? This would be the movement of molecules. When we look at a system, we can think of all the energy that a system possesses such as its potential and kinetic energy, as being its internal energy. And the variable for internal energy can be either capital U or capital E. Now, since energy is always conserved, according to the first law of thermodynamics, if one type of energy changes in a system, then another type is going to change in the opposite direction in order to counteract that change. We can look at this mathematically as follows. The changes in kinetic energy, potential energy, internal energy, all of these changes need to add up to zero because, again, the total energy is conserved. Um, it can't be created or destroyed. To make sure we understand the basics of kinetic and potential energy, let's look at a few problems and see if we can determine, in this case, whether the potential energy increases or decreases. We'll start with a positive ion, a cation, and a negative ion. If we pull them apart from one another and we separate them, what are we doing to the potential energy? Well, because of their strong attraction for one another, if we pull them apart, now there's more and more potential energy. Therefore, it increases. What about a skier who skis from the top to the bottom of the hill? Well, at the top, the skier had high potential energy. At the bottom, low potential energy. Therefore, potential energy decreases. A person climbing a flight of stairs would have the opposite change. They are going from a low point to a high point. Therefore, their potential energy is increasing. So since the first law of thermodynamics states that the total energy of the universe is constant, that energy is conserved, then when we have a system that is gaining or losing energy in the form of, say, heat lost to the surroundings, or maybe work that is done on the systems or the surroundings, um, we would look at the change in the internal energy of the system being expressed in both of those terms. In other words, the sum of the heat lost or gained and the work done on the system or surroundings, that sum is going to be equal to the internal energy change for the system. This is another expression, as I said, of the first law of thermodynamics. Heat has the variable Q, work has the variable W. Now, when we calculate the total internal energy change that is occurring, we need to remember that um, this calculated value is what's called a state function. It depends only on initial and final states. It does not depend on the pathway by which we get from initial to final state. Sometimes people have trouble understanding what exactly this concept of a state function is. And so I want to point out a really nice analogy that might help you understand what a state function is. Let's look at 
two campsites on a mountain. Campsite A down at the bottom, campsite B at the top. So this is an analogy for a state function. And what we're looking at is the elevation depth difference between site A and site B. Whether we take the pathway on the left or the pathway on the right, the total elevation difference would be the same. So that's very similar to a state function. Uh, whether we go by pathway on the left or the pathway on the right, uh, the total energy change would also be the same. And so that is what a state function is. Now, one of the ways that a system um, will exchange energy with its surroundings is in the form of heat. And in a chemical reaction, such as the one shown here, uh, we have a reaction that's actually releasing heat to the surroundings. This is the oxidation of CH4, otherwise known as methane. Um, this is a fast oxidation reaction, which would be a combustion reaction. So if we burn methane, methane is also one of the main components of natural gas, we know that heat is released in that fire, and it's going to be released from the system to the surroundings. So there we have the chemical equation for that reaction. Let's go ahead and balance the equation. Notice we have one carbon on each side of the equation. However, we have four hydrogens on the left and only two on the right, so we'll need to put a two coefficient in front of the water. Now if we count up our oxygens, we actually have four oxygens on the right and only two on the left, so we'll need to put a two in front of the oxygen, and now this equation is balanced. So we said earlier energy was released to the surroundings in the form of heat. Um, this type of reaction that releases heat to the surroundings is known as an exothermic reaction. And the heat value that we calculate would have a negative sign in front of it, denoting that heat is given off to the surroundings. If we had a reaction, on the other hand, that instead of releasing heat, absorbed heat from the surroundings, that one would be referred to as endothermic. Endo meaning inside, the heat is coming into the system. And for that, we would have a Q value, a heat value, with a positive sign. So let's now look at a calculation involving the internal energy of a system, the heat and the work of the system. So in this particular problem, we are told that we have a chemical reaction that releases 466 joules of heat. Okay, so generated or released tells me that the heat value is negative. Next, we're told that there are 656 joules of work that are being done by the system. If they're done by the system, they're done on the surroundings, and that is also a negative sign for the work value. We're asked to calculate the change in the internal energy of the system. We'll use the equation delta E equals Q plus W. We'll then plug in the Q and W values. You see how important it is that we got the sign correct for each value. And then finally, we will calculate the delta E, which ends up being a negative 1,112 joules. A common type of work that is done by a chemical system on the surroundings is expansion work. As you can see in this diagram, going from initial to final state, what's happening in the system? The volume is increasing. So we have a positive delta V. That's what we refer to as expansion work because when this um, volume increasing, you're now pushing against the surroundings and therefore doing work on the surroundings. This is something that happens in the internal combustion engine of an automobile. So we have a chemical reaction, which is the combustion of gasoline. It produces gases, carbon dioxide and water vapor, and those gases have a much higher volume than the initial volume of the system. In addition to the volume increase, we also have heat being released. Okay, so when the volume increases, uh, the cylinder pushes back the piston. Um, the piston is in, uh, translated into motion of the car. The so work is done by the expanding gas, and it does depend on the pressure of the gas. It also depends on the volume change of the gas. We have an equation that we can use to calculate that work, that expansion work. 
and the equation is W work equals negative P times delta V. So if we have such a system and we know the volume change and we know the pressure, we can then calculate the work, the expansion work that's being done. And if we have a Q value, we can combine those together to get the internal energy change of the system. So now we're going to look at a calculation of this expansion work. Looking at the information given to us, we have an initial volume of 46 liters, a final volume of 64 liters, and we have the pressure. So we'll need to calculate that delta V, that volume change. And they are asked to calculate the work associated with this expansion. So the volume change, of course, is going to be the final volume minus the initial volume. The delta V is 18 liters. We then combine that with the pressure of 15 atmospheres using W equals negative P delta V. And we get a work value. Notice the pressure is in atmospheres and the delta V is in liters. Therefore, the work that we calculate here is not in joules, but rather it is in units of liters times atmospheres. We need to convert that over to joules. And in order to do that, we need a conversion factor. And it turns out that there are 101.3 joules in one liter atmosphere. So we can use that as our conversion factor. You see the liter atmospheres cancel out, and we will have the work value now in joules, which is negative 27,000 joules. The reason we rounded this number like we did is because the pressure and the delta volume both had two significant figures. Therefore, our final answer also needed to have two significant figures, so we rounded it uh, to have those two sig figs. Now we're going to look at a problem that combines expansion work along with heat in order to calculate a delta E and internal energy change for a process. And what we're looking at in this problem is a hot air balloon. So in this hot air balloon, we have a volume change that happens when we heat the air inside the balloon. The volume goes from 4 times 10 to the 6 liters to 4.5 times 10 to the 6 liters. We're also having to put heat into the balloon to make that happen. So if you're adding heat to the system, the sign of Q is going to be positive, right? So let's summarize our data. We want to calculate work. We also want to calculate delta E. That's the final thing that we are asked to calculate. So it's going to be a two-step process. First, we're going to need to use our volumes and our pressure to determine the expansion work. So if we subtract the two volumes, we get the delta V of 5.0 times 10 to the 5 liters. If we combine that with the pressure of one atmosphere, we are able to calculate a work value of negative 5 times 10 to the 5 liters atmospheres. Remember, we need to convert that to joules. So we're going to multiply that by 101.3 joules per 1 liter atmosphere, and we get a work value of negative 5.07 times 10 to the 7 joules. We did include an extra sig fig. When you see ESF, that means extra sig fig. Since the work is an intermediate calculation, I always like to include an extra sig fig and not round uh, to the proper number of sig figs until we get to the end. How do I know that there's fewer than three? Because the pressure had two sig figs, so the work really should have two. Next, we're going to combine the work we just calculated with the Q value that was given, and we made the Q positive because we were putting heat into the system. So if we combine Q and W, we add them together. Be careful because you are adding a positive Q and a negative work together. So be careful with your signs. We end up with a delta E of positive 7.9 times 10 to the 7 joules. We have a huge value for this internal energy change, obviously, because we're working with a giant hot air balloon, not just a small chemical reaction happening in a flask. So now I'm going to introduce the variable called enthalpy. Enthalpy is interchangeable with Q. The only um, 
caveat is that enthalpy is when you're at constant pressure. Otherwise, delta H and Q are interchangeable and they really are the same thing. Now, if heat is released to the surroundings, we knew that Q is negative, delta H then will also be negative, and that would be an exothermic reaction. If heat is absorbed from the surroundings to the system, delta H is positive, and that is an endothermic reaction. Now we're going to look at a problem where we would calculate an enthalpy change for a reaction. In this problem, we're going to look at the heat produced when a mixture of gasoline and ethanol is burned. Most of the gasoline that you get from the gas stations today contains about 10% ethanol. The reason for that is ethanol is a renewable resource. It's produced by the fermentation of corn and grasses. These are biomass materials, and it's more environmentally friendly to use ethanol than it is to use petroleum, which is obtained from drilling underground. Okay. So we have this mixture, and we're given some information. Let's summarize the information we're given. So we're told that the heat of combustion of ethane is 326.7 kilocalories per mole of ethanol. And then we're told that the heat of combustion of hexane is 995 kilocalories per mole. It's clear that we do get a lot more heat out of hexane, which is very similar to gasoline, than we do from ethanol. What we want to find out is how much energy is released when we burn not one mole, but 421 grams of hexane, and then we're going to do the calculation with 421 grams of ethanol. When you think about it, this really comes down to a simple stoichiometry calculation. First, we need to know, okay, well, how many grams are in one mole of each substance? So the molar mass of hexane is 86.20 grams per mole, and so we can divide the delta H value, which is given in kilocalories per mole. If we divide that by molar mass, you can see that the moles will cancel out, and you're left with kilocalories per gram. And then we multiply that by the grams given in the problem, and we see that grams cancel out, and now we have the kilocalories for that quantity of hexane undergoing combustion. We do the same thing with the ethanol. Divide it by the molar mass of ethanol. Now we have kilocalories per gram, and then we multiply it by the number of grams that we were asked to calculate it for, 421 grams, and we now have straight kilocalories for that quantity undergoing combustion. And so you can see that the combustion of ethanol provides less energy than the combustion of hexane. If we wanted to measure the heat or enthalpy of a reaction, we would use a technique called calorimetry. Calorimetry uses a calorimeter, which is simply a device that uh, is, has a really good insulating material around it so that we don't have heat being transferred between the system and surroundings, and we can accurately measure the heat produced or absorbed by a chemical reaction. Okay, so in your Hess's Law experiment, if you took the lab in person, uh, you used what's called a coffee cup calorimeter. Different substances require different amounts of heat to raise the temperature of one gram of one substance by one degree Celsius. This is referred to as the specific heat or the heat capacity of that substance. We're going to need that constant when we do these calorimeter calculations. So in order to measure the heat absorbed or released by a chemical reaction occurring in this coffee cup calorimeter, we're going to need to measure the temperature change that happens with the reaction, and we're also going to have to measure the mass of the substances in the calorimeter. And the heat evolved or absorbed is equal to the mass times the C sub SP, the specific heat capacity of the substance times the change in temperature that happened with that reaction. The specific heat C sub SP values that you'll need for these problems are found in the reference tables in OWL, and they're all listed here as well. So in OWL 7.4, we are asked, what is the energy change when the temperature 
of 11.9 grams of solid titanium is decreased from 38.8 degrees Celsius to 24.0 degrees Celsius. So we have our delta T, we have our mass, and we are asked to calculate the energy change or enthalpy change. We're going to need to find the specific heat capacity for titanium, Ti. In the table I just showed you, that value is 0.523 joules per gram per degree Celsius. And there's the other information that was given in the problem. So now we're going to set up our equation. Q is equal to M times C sub S T times delta T. Then we'll just simply plug in all the numbers that we just obtained, and we will determine the Q value in joules for this one to be negative 92.1. Since we have a negative Q value, we would say that this is an exothermic reaction. So what we were just looking at involved heat being released as a substance cooled down. Uh, where is that heat released to? Well, in a calorimeter, uh, that material would be sitting in water, and so the heat would be released to the water, and the water's temperature would go up while the metal's temperature goes down. Another part of that system that's going to absorb some of that heat is the calorimeter itself, the styrofoam cup. It will also absorb some of that heat. And so if we look at the big picture, what we're going to say is that the heat lost by the metal will equal the heat gained by the water and the heat gained by the calorimeter. And the equation is going to involve those three things. And we're going to need all of the data for each of those things. So when you start digging in the word problem, you find, okay, the mass of platinum metal was 67.64 grams. The mass of water, 77.92 grams. We don't need the mass of the calorimeter because the heat capacity of the calorimeter does not have grams in the denominator. Then we look at the final temperatures. Notice they're all the same. That's because the temperature is equilibrated. The, the metal cooled down and the water and the calorimeter heated up and they kind of met in the middle. The initial temperatures, as you see, were different. The platinum was much hotter. The water was cooler, so was the calorimeter. You'll always assume the calorimeters temperatures are the same as the water's temperatures. We calculated delta T. Um, the platinum temperature going down means we have a negative delta T. The water and the calorimeter's temperature going up means we have a positive delta T for those. Notice the water and the calorimeter only went up by about 2 degrees Celsius. The platinum went down by 74, almost 75 degrees Celsius. Why is that? It has to do with the heat capacity. Water has a much higher heat capacity and therefore has a greater ability to absorb heat and you won't see as much of a temperature change from it because of its higher heat capacity. Okay, so we don't have the specific heat of the platinum. That's what we're asked to calculate. When you're doing these calorimeter problems, we have a whole table's worth of data and there's going to be one data point somewhere in that table missing and you're going to use this equation as your starting point to calculating that missing piece of the puzzle. So as I said earlier, the heat lost by the metal is equal to the heat gained by the water plus the heat gained by the calorimeter. And that mathematically is shown here. Notice the heat lost by the metal is negative. The heat gained by the water and the calorimeter are positive. What we're going to do now is we're going to substitute into each of those Qs the specific heat equation. So for the metal, we have negative. Now Q becomes mass times heat capacity times delta T. And over on the right, same thing. The Q for the water becomes mass times heat capacity of water times delta T. The calorimeter, I said earlier, we don't need mass in there. So it's just calorimeter constant times delta T. Let's plug in all the data that we know. And we'll solve for the piece of data that we don't know, which as you can see here, is the heat capacity of the platinum. You probably can find this in your table of specific heat capacities. However, in this problem, they're wanting to, you to use experimental data to calculate the heat capacity of the platinum. So that's what we're going to do, even though, yeah, we could just look it up in the table. 
you're going to get a slightly different number when you do that than when you use experimental data to calculate it. So mathematically, this can be a little tricky. We're going to need to consolidate each of these terms. So that's what I typically do first is I multiply all the constants together, put them together, and simplify the equation a little bit. And I'm going to add those two numbers on the right. I'm going to divide the sum of those two numbers by the 5040.5, and that will give me the heat capacity of the platinum, which is 0.129 joules per gram per degree Celsius. And I will tell you that heat capacities are always positive. So if you go through this whole calculation and you get a negative C value, you know you've done something wrong. A heat capacity is always a positive variable. In this problem, we're asked to calculate the enthalpy of dissolution or the Q of dissolution for the ammonium perchlorate. And they're wanting it not in straight joules, but in kilojoules per mole, which means after we calculate the Q, we're going to need to convert it from joules to kilojoules, and then we're going to need to put it in terms of one mole, not in terms of the quantity that underwent reaction, which in this case is just 3.99 grams. So let's summarize our data. We have the solution where the dissolution is happening. And in that solution, there is the solute and the solvent. And their combined mass is, two, is uh, the sum of those two numbers. And then we have our final temperature of everything. And remember, final temperatures are the same for every part of the system. We have our initial temperatures, which are different for each. And we can calculate a delta T from each of those. We also have the specific heat capacity of the solution. Since the solution is mostly water, we use the specific heat capacity of water. And then the calorimeter constant is always given in your problem because every calorimeter is going to have a slightly different calorimeter constant depending on the size of the calorimeter. So we're trying to calculate the heat or enthalpy of dissolution. And so the Q of dissolution is still equal to the Q of the water plus the Q of the calorimeter, but we're just going to be solving for the Q of the dissolution. We're not going to break that down any further. We will break down the Q of the water and the Q of the calorimeter as we did before. We now substitute values into that equation. We have the mass of the solution, the heat capacity of the water, and the delta T, and then we have the calorimeter constant and the delta T. So when we plug everything in, we get the negative Q of dissolution equal to negative 1280, but we do need to convert that, like I said, from straight joules to kilojoules per mole. So the, the joules that we measured corresponded to 3.99 grams of ammonium perchlorate. We're going to convert that to joules per mole and then kilojoules per mole using basic dimensional analysis. And we get a final value of 37.7 kilojoules per mole. Notice this negative 1280 was negative Q of dissolution. And so positive Q of dissolution would be positive 1280. And that's why we have a positive number for our final answer. So now we're going to switch gears and look at Hess's law. Hess's law describes the fact that the enthalpy change for a reaction is a state function. You know what a state function is. It's one that is independent of pathway, only depends on initial and final states. So if we're looking at a series of steps for chemical reactions, let's say you have a two-step reaction and we're looking at step one on the top and step two on the bottom. The overall reaction is the sum of those two steps. And in this case, we know the delta H of step one. We know the delta H of step two. We don't know it for, for the overall reaction. How will we go about getting it? Simply, we would simply say that the combined pathway at the bottom, the delta H is equal to the sum of the individual steps of the pathway above. And you can see that kind of mathematically by seeing that when you add those two equations together, there's certain compounds or elements 
that will cancel out. In other words, they show up on the left and on the right in the same way, like O2. Is there anything else that's exactly the same on the left and right? Yes, there's two and O's. They also cancel out. What we're left with is the sum of the two reactions. And since the two reactions added to give the bottom reaction, the delta H's will add to give the bottom reaction. The sum of those two numbers is positive 68 kilojoules. So what I just did is the process of using Hess's law to solve for the enthalpy change for a reaction uh, when I have a series of additive reactions that add up to the desired reaction. Let's look at another example. Here we have a two-step reaction and we have the uh, reactants at the bottom and the products at the top. We can look at the one. Since we know the standard enthalpy changes for those two reactions, um, let's see if we can find a way to make those two reactions add up to give the third reaction, and then we would be able to add the two delta H values together. So as is, uh, they do not add up to the bottom reaction. We're going to need to manipulate them a little bit. First, I'm going to take reaction one, and I'm going to multiply it by two. I'm doing that because I can see right off the bat that I do need two of the N2O4 molecules to be represented. So if I multiply the, re the coefficients by two, I also have to multiply the delta H by two, and the delta H becomes positive 18.4 kilojoules instead of 9.2 kilojoules. Now I can see, okay, I have one oxygen on the right, I have four on the left. They're going to cancel out to give me just three on the left. Next, I notice that there are two nitrogens on both sides. They completely cancel out. Everything else is going to remain behind. We have two N2Os, dinitrogen monoxides, reacting with three O2s to form two N2O4s. That is the bottom equation. Now that the two reactions add to give the bottom equation, we can add the delta H's of the two reactions to get the delta H of the bottom reaction. Again, this is an illustration of Hess's law. And when you add those two numbers together, negative 164.2 and positive 18.4, you get negative 148.5.8 kilojoules. This next problem is a very challenging Hess's Law problem. If there are more than two reactions that have to be manipulated and added together, this would be a bonus level question. So we have four different reactions and we want to manipulate them to make them add up to the bottom reaction. So what I usually do is I'll start with the first reactant of the desired reaction at the bottom, two boron solids. Then I'm going to look at the given reactions and see if I can find two boron solids anywhere. And it's already there in that same form in the first reaction. So I'm going to leave the first reaction as is. Now I go to the second reactant, 3H2 gas, and I look to see where I can find that in the three reactions. And the only place where H2 gas appears is in reaction C, but there's one mole instead of three moles. Therefore, I'm going to multiply reaction three, reaction C by three. And when I do that, we end up with three H2s, three halves of an O2, and three H2O liquids. I multiply the delta H by three, three times negative 286, and I get negative 858 kilojoules. Okay, now I need to find B2H6 in one of the above reactions. Well, I see it in reaction B, but it's on the reactant, not the product side. So what am I going to need to do? I'm going to need to flip reaction B. And when I flip it, it's going to look like this. And what's going to happen to the delta H when you reverse the reaction? It simply changes signs. Okay, it goes from negative to positive in this case. So let's see if we can add the given reactions together to get the desired reaction. And before I do that, 
I'm going to need three waters on both sides of this bottom equation so that my 3H2O gas can cancel out with the 3H2O gas in reaction B. So I'm going to need to multiply the bottom one by 3, which is going to make this value positive 132. You can see this is a much more complicated example. That's why I'm reserving this type of question for a bonus question on the test. Let's see what cancels out. So the 3H2O liquid cancels out with 3H2O liquid. The 3H2O gas cancels out there. The 3 halves plus 3 halves, which is 3 oxygens on the left, cancel with the 3 oxygens on the right. The B2O3 solid on the left cancels out with the B2O3 solid on the right. I'm left with my desired reaction. And now I'm ready to add all the delta H's together to get the delta H for the desired reaction. And it winds up being positive 36 kilojoules, just a slightly endothermic reaction. We can also use standard enthalpies of formation. These are values that would come from a reference table in OWL V2, and they correspond to the delta H is a formation uh, from the elements in their standard states. So the degree sign means all, substance are, all substances are at standard conditions. What are standard conditions? One atmosphere of pressure, in this case 25 degrees Celsius, and if it's a solution, one mole per liter. If you have an element in its standard state, its delta H of formation would be zero. So to calculate the enthalpy change for a reaction, using these standard values, you're going to use this equation. It looks complicated, but it really isn't. What this equation says is that the standard enthalpy change for a reaction is equal to the sum of the enthalpy changes for the products, each multiplied by its molar coefficient, that's what the N is, minus the sum of the enthalpies of formation times each one's moles of the reactants. So I like to say this is simply products minus reactants. In a problem like OWL 7.11, you're going to need to get the delta H's of formation of all reactants and products. And again, you'll get that from the thermodynamic table in OWL V2. When I looked that up, I found that the iron solid, since that is the natural state for that element, it has a zero value. Same thing with the hydrogen. That's an element in its standard state, so its enthalpy of formation is zero. The other two compounds do have numerical enthalpies of formation. So we write out the equation, the products minus reactants equation. Then we plug in the products. We have three iron solids. That one was zero, but we have four gaseous waters. That's what we did in the first part of the calculation. And then on the reactant side, uh, we had one Fe3O4 and no H2s. So when you combine those numbers, you get the delta H0, the standard enthalpy change for the reaction, being equal to positive 259.2 kilojoules. In this problem, we are told that in a certain reaction where one mole of P4O10 reacts with liquid water, you get phosphoric acid, and 453 kilojoules of energy are evolved. If the energy is evolved, is it endothermic or exothermic? Definitely exothermic. We have a negative value for the delta H. In this problem, we have a reaction between H2S and O2, and we are told that 518 kilojoules of energy are evolved per one mole of H2S. We need to complete the thermochemical equation, but notice in the equation we have two moles of H2S. So we're going to need to do a simple calculation. The negative fight 518 corresponds to one mole of H2S. In our balanced equation, we have two moles of H2S, so the delta H that corresponds to that balanced equation is negative 1,036 kilojoules.
So this last section of the chapter deals with the everyday application of chemical energy. And we all think and talk about energy um, fairly often in our daily lives because we use it every single day. At the current time, most of the energy that we use comes from burning fossil fuels or petroleum, natural gas. These are fossil fuels. Another fossil fuel is coal. All of these fossil fuels are called that because they come from decayed marine organisms that are held under pressure for a really long time, and that's how these materials are created. Um, coal is an example of almost pure elemental carbon. If we look at our energy usage over the last 150 years, we'll see that it's changed quite dramatically. Go back to the 1850s, what was most of our energy? It was actually mostly obtained from burning wood. Going in through the Industrial Revolution into the early 1900s, you see a huge shift. Now in 1900, we have 71% of our energy being in the form of coal. Only 21% is wood now. There's also 5% petroleum natural gas, 3% hydro and nuclear. And moving through time, what we're seeing is that the petroleum and natural gas increased, peaked out in the mid-1970s, and is now declining as other forms of energy are on the rise, including hydro and nuclear. Our predominant source of energy today is petroleum. Uh, petroleum is a thick and viscous black fluid made mostly of hydrocarbons. Hydrocarbons are compounds that contain only carbon and hydrogen. They take the petroleum and they thermally crack it. This process breaks the molecules into smaller molecules. And we have this mixture of hundreds of different molecules in this thermally cracked petroleum. Now we're going to separate that mixture through a process called distillation. The distillation process produces separate fractions. You can see in the table on the right the different fractions. So gasoline is a mixture that contains compounds that have anywhere between five carbons and 10 carbons. Your kerosene, your jet fuel are gonna be larger molecules going from about 10 to 15 carbons. And then you have the diesel fuel, the heating oil, and the lubricating oil. These are even larger molecules between 15 and 25 carbons. The asphalt that we use to pave our roads, this is also a petroleum product and this would be comprised of molecules with 25 or more carbon atoms. That's why the asphalt is a solid, not a liquid, not a gas. What happens when we burn the, this material, these fossil fuels? Well, when you burn carbon, the products of the combustion are carbon dioxide and water H2O. And this brings us to the question of, okay, if we're burning hydrocarbons and they're putting carbon dioxide in the water into the atmosphere, uh, what kind of an effect might they be having on Earth if we have millions and millions of processes, namely automobiles and power plants that are burning these materials and putting tons and tons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere? Well, in order to understand that, first we need to understand the basics. Without humans' intervention, the Earth had a greenhouse effect and it still has that effect. What is the greenhouse effect? The greenhouse effect is the trapping of heat by gases in Earth's atmosphere like water, carbon dioxide, methane, and other gases uh, to keep the Earth warm. This is a wonderful effect that actually makes the Earth warm enough for life to be supported. So without the greenhouse effect, Earth would be too cold and life would not exist. So the greenhouse effect is a natural process that happened long before man started burning fossil fuels. As I mentioned, though, in the last 250 years since the Industrial Revolution, the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has slowly been increasing. And scientists have associated this increase in carbon dioxide with increases in average global temperatures. There's a relationship between atmospheric carbon dioxide concentration and Earth's temperature, and it's not fully understood because obviously we have a very multifactorial system, not just a simple one-to-one -one relationship. 
However, we are concerned. Uh, one of the measures is average temperature on Earth, and the past 10 years have been the warmest decade on record. The implications of increasing atmospheric CO2 levels needs to be considered as future energy needs are met. These concerns are prompting the development of new energy sources. Some of those new energy sources include solar power, wind power, geothermal, hydropower, biomass. Um, these are some new energy sources that are being considered in light of global climate change. Take a look at some of these energy sources and some of the benefits and problems that would come along with them. We'll start with nuclear because we live in an area that has a huge portion of our energy in the form of nuclear energy. So does nuclear energy produce greenhouse gases? No, it does not. What are the benefits? We can provide a lot of power through this form of energy. However, the problems are in a nuclear power plant, you're generating nuclear waste, and that waste needs to be disposed of. There's safety issues associated with this, and there's a huge cost associated with this. Another form of energy, biodiesel or biomass, um, when you burn these materials, yes, there are still greenhouse gases produced. However, these are renewable resources, and fewer pollutants are associated with burning them than are associated with burning fossil fuels. So the problem is also cost and the fact that we're producing greenhouse gases anyway. What's another energy type? Well, we have solar energy. Solar energy doesn't produce any greenhouse gases, and there are no emissions when you use solar energy. However, we have high cost. We have problems with storing uh, materials after the solar panels are no longer usable, and also weather dependent. So when the sun's not out, you're not going to be generating as much energy through solar power. With wind energy, we also have no greenhouse gases being produced, fairly clean source of energy. Um, another problem in, is, again, that wind power is dependent on the weather. Uh, hydrogen, we didn't mention before, but the burning of hydrogen does not produce greenhouse gases. It essentially produces water. And so the benefits are that it also burns very cleanly. The problems are to produce hydrogen gas that is needed for this, you are going to have to burn some fossil fuels, and there's a high cost associated with that. And then ethanol produces carbon dioxide. However, it's another reproducible or renewable resource, um, not quite as efficient, and still it does produce greenhouse gases. So we have a lot of op options for energy sources. Um, there are benefits and there are challenges associated with each of them. This concludes Chapter 7, Chemical Energy. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out.